Um, before we begin, I just want to let you know about next week's, uh, sorry, the 14th, yeah, next week. The next CERC seminar is um, given by Dr. Yu Xiaojiang, academic associate in the Department of Geography at Hong Kong Baptist University. Uh, he'll be giving a talk on the sociocultural effects of returning overseas Filipino workers in the Philippine society. But today, I would like to introduce you to um, Samson Lim, Dr. Samson Lim, a very good old friend of mine. We met in the very first, our, my, our very first PhD class together at Cornell University, 10 a.m. in pre-modern, history of pre-modern Southeast Asia. That's how I remember, Thursday morning, a long time ago. So I've known Samson for many, many years. And he's currently an assistant professor in history at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. He received his PhD in history at Cornell University. And his current research examines the connections between technology, capitalism, and culture. His first book, entitled Sam's New Detectives, Visualizing Crime and Conspiracy in Modern Thailand, is forthcoming by the University of Hawaii Press. And it's a history of the visual culture of policing in Thailand during the early 20th century. He's currently working on a new project, which will be a cultural history of capitalism and the money economy in early 20th century Bangkok. He is also the, princi he's also the principal lead of the Opportunity Lab at the Singapore University of Technology and Design, a center that seeks to understand and enhance the role that design and designers play in social change. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Samson. Great. Thanks, Samson. Thanks a lot, Tom. Um, appreciate the introduction, and I want to thank the department for inviting me and kind of hosting me. It's always really good to kind of get an opportunity to share new work and get feedback from, from different groups of scholars that I don't normally interact with, so this is really good. Um, as Tom mentioned, this is part of a new project that I'm just starting, and so the, the project, I the way I see it is kind of a, a, a cultural history of capitalism, uh, late 19th, early 20th century, um, primarily focused in Bangkok. And I'm interested in looking at kind of the history of capitalism through things like um, kind of crime, through financial crimes, counterfeiting, um, bank scandals, things like that. Um, it's just to see kind of what crime and criminality actually might tell us about um, kind of underlying rules or uh, related to kind of the administration of capitalism in this time period. So again, this is preliminary, so um, the part I'm going to present today is kind of a, it's focused on a couple of things. Uh, one is, is counterfeit paper money and um, the introduction of photography. So you've got these two things that I'm, I'm interested in and I'm looking at kind of their relationship, so that's what I'm going to talk about mostly today. Normally, kind of as a historian, I just kind of tell these shaggy dog stories, right? With no theory, and we just kind of ramble on, that's what we do. So, but in the interest of kind of clarity and, and, and order, um, I just I try to kind of front load a little bit with um, some guiding questions and uh, some structure. I don't have like thesis, right? A thesis statement or hypothesis. I I kind of do, but I think it's better at, at this point in, in the project to just kind of present a couple of questions um, that are kind of guiding what I'm doing in this paper, what I'll do today, and then uh, as part of the bigger project. So kind of I'm interested again, kind of as Tom mentioned, kind of how does technology uh, shape the nature and functioning of, of capitalism and bureaucracy? Um, and how does that relate to um, the way people think about concepts like profit? Or, or time, or interest in bank accounts and things like that. Um, another question that I, I'm kind of interested in, I mentioned this, is kind of how do the study of financial crimes like forgery, what do they tell us about things like theory of value, about symbolic value? And finally, this is kind of more of the um, area studies focused question is kind of, um, does the archival sources and the documents that I'm looking at what do they tell us about the government response, and how does that add to this idea that some scholars um, in anthropology um, have called in Thailand the regime of images or disorder of appearances? And uh, I'll get into that towards the later part of the talk. Okay, so um, 
those are kind of the, the overarching questions that I'm interested in in this paper. Um, today's talk is going to kind of go through a couple of different um, uh, parts. And so it's, I'll start with this background, a look at Bangkok in the early 20th century, talk broadly about kind of the physical, social, and cultural changes that are going on in this period. Um, then I'll move on to this introduction of what people like Matthew Hall and Anthropology have called the kind of government of papers. Um, we talk about paper currency and the introduction of kind of new paper-based technologies. And then I'll move on to talk about um, counterfeiting, this counterfeiting crisis that took place in the early 20th century. And I'll end with kind of looking at the government response to counterfeit. Um, so that will be the kind of flow of the talk. I think I think I should get to about 40 minutes, or maybe a little bit earlier. Um, some of the examples start to get repetitive in the archives, so we'll see how it goes. Um, Okay, so I'm actually going to start uh, by talking about a fictional story. All right, there in the 1921, the kind of first indigenous detective novel, a crime fiction novel, appeared in uh, Thailand in a monthly journal called Sena Sosale, Prayawit Yesa, um, which is kind of like military studies and the spread of science. Um, and in this uh, novel, um, the villain, the main villain, is this guy named Praya Kamnun Tanasa. So he is a wealthy man. He has this big bungalow. Um, it's filled with Western style furniture, like chairs and tables, which people probably didn't have at that point. Um, and what's interesting about this is um, he has in this house a dark room. A secret dark room, which is accessed through a secret door here. This is just an illustration from it. Um, here he is, being uh, the, here the cops are kind of busting in and going to arrest him. And in this dark room, he is using the latest kind of photographic technologies. You can see his chemicals and things here to reprint uh, counterfeit bills, paper money, government paper money. So what I like about, or why I kind of chose to start with this kind of fictional example uh, because it reflects and sort of encapsulates a lot of the themes that I think um, are interesting about this period of time. Okay. Uh, here's a newly rich um, person from kind of murky or unclear background. He's not the aristocracy. Um, there's this kind of, in this novel again, this mystification of paper money and photography kind of this fascination with it. There's also this, the theme of criminality in a changing Bangkok. And um, in the backdrop, there's this idea, that there's this rapid modernization and physical change going on in the city. So, in any other words, um, that the novel's villain, uh, his, that his crime is counterfeit makes perfect sense in this period of time. And here's where I just kind of, kind of go into back to real life, right, outside of fiction. So by most accounts, the early 20th century, um, Bangkok was a city undergoing significant change. Canals, like this one, uh, along the main arteries of the city's transportation and economic system were being paid, uh, built in and paved over. And these roads, um, in addition to kind of, um, uh, su kind of supporting travel within the city, were, uh, Spawning new kinds of development. There's new road. For example, row houses. Um, and they were also connecting Bangkok to the kind of suburbs, what they would call the suburbs outside of the, the wall city. And so you have a different kind of development as well, kind of the larger bungalows for, for the new kind of um, emerging but small middle class right? at this period. You also start to see in this period of time, electrified tramways, hotels, hospitals, and other new buildings um, as they make their way into the city. So in addition to kind of having all these new things kind of connect the city itself, you also have um, the development of a new railway system connecting Bangkok to areas to the north, the northeast, and the south. Um, so Bangkok then just was a quickly 
becoming a modern place, right? And by 1913, the transformation of the city had been so kind of dramatic um, that you know people were noticing as far away as places like Shanghai and the U.S. One newspaper in Shanghai called the Far Eastern Review published an opinion piece um, that cited the construction of things like roads and railways and the <coughs> sanitation system as signs of the kingdom's progress. With these physical changes came a number of other cultural changes, right? We came in kind of hand in hand. Um, more and more people, for example, adopted pastimes like going to the cinema. The cinema. Um, I can tell, right? There's also, um, this is just a, from a 1913 newspaper showing um, movies and showing time, uh, screening times, right? They were also doing things like cruising those new roads um, in their new cars. Um, as you can see here, and you can see the number of automobiles goes up from 401 in 1910 to over 3,000 in 1929, so 3,361. Uh, people also began to dress for these occasions in things like suit jackets and trousers, um, despite the humidity and the heat. Sorry, my mouth is really dry from the air conditioning. Um, People also started to take up uh, leisure reading. So things like newspapers, European style fiction, which were appearing in an <coughs> increasingly large number of journals. So this is, a, I like this picture as well. This is from Sanran, Sanran Wikia. You see a, a new kind of middle class Bangkokian relaxing and reading on a nice leisurely day in his house. And if you look at data that I, so for example, data I pulled from the Bibliography of the National Library in Thailand, you can see in fact that the number of uh, non-daily serials that were started, so between say 1824 and 1851, sorry, 1868, was uh, 47. And then uh, you see as the kind of periods go on, uh, the number of periodicals grows, and a number of these actually lasted only for a, a short while, maybe a year, sometimes even less. But the point is that you can see in this period of time, there is this kind of print culture or um, a number of, like a reading culture that starts to develop, however limited it is in Bangkok. Now in these journals, what you start to see um, is a mixture of things, right? Fiction, news reports, shipping tables, um, advertisements, for things that are, for a number of different kinds of projects, Asahi beer, I don't have one here, but there's like Japanese pipple cream, uh, stomach medicine, scotch, Ford, Ford Motors, right? So in other words, consumerism is coming in hand in hand with uh, leisure reading. So that's kind of the physical and the cultural changes just as a kind of broad outline. Underlying and enabling these physical and cultural transformations was a less visible but equally material set of innovations. And these are things, kind of advances, you might say, in administration or capitalism, like formal credit instruments, international financial loans, title deeds, diplomas, lottery tickets, <laughs> etc., that spurred uh, speculative investment in real estate and land. Um, and also allowed for people to kind of enjoy in these kind of newfangled leisure time activities. <coughs> so the, just as one example, the link kind of between this paper-based economy that's starting to develop in the late 19th and early 20th century um, and the idea of be becoming modern is quite clear also in the way that um, the nature of the first international loan taken out by the Siamese government it was to fund the railway, railway actually linked to the north rather than say the irrigation scheme that was also being proposed at the same time. Um, I think partly because at this period, if you look at the history of technology uh, broadly, the railway is seen as a kind of a symbol of modernity in a way that some other, other technologies really are not. <coughs> um, so in short, technologies like title deeds, arrest warrants, medical prescriptions, and newspaper ads uh, made the era of reform the late 19th and early 20th century a decidedly paper-based one. 
So of all of these kind of paper-based innovations, I think I'm, one seems to be um, clearly one of the most important is paper, paper money. Right. Paper money was officially introduced late to Siam or to, to Thailand. I'll just use Thailand. Um, in 1902. The Department of Paper Currency established, was established that year and it started issuing notes in September. Um, prior to this, there were a few kind of experiments, a short-lived experiment in the 1880s, and then there were also three international banks, um, HSBC being one of them, um, issuing banknotes. In the first year of operation, the first day of operation, about 62,000 baht in coin were exchanged for the notes. By the end of October, the government, the value of government notes in circulation was about just over a million baht. Six months on, that grew to three million, about three and a half million. And then a year on, um, the value in circulation of paper notes was just over six million baht. So this is this amount may not have been high relative to say countries in Europe or the U.S. For example, the U.S. Um, but the trend is pretty clear. If you look at the data from the Ministry of Finance and the Department of Paper Currency, as of 1907, the amount was, that was in circulation was about 15 million baht. 1911, that rises to 18, then to over 30 million in 1915. And the total value um, by 1941, which is an on this chart, is um, just under 300 million baht. So the trend is pretty clear. This is kind of an artificial spike from during World War I. Um, through the lack of silver for coinage, um, that the popularity of paper money is growing over this period of time. Right. So at the same time, and I don't have good data for this, but you can kind of see coin um, is becoming less popular relative to paper money. The point is that by the 1920s, uh, paper money has become kind of the dominant a very critical kind of mode of exchange um, in daily life. Right. So that's again kind of the backdrop is Bangkok physical cultural change, looking at the growth of the kind of paper based economy and the introduction of paper money, government paper money. So, as you might expect, when a government switches over kind of paper based representations of authority and value, the incentive and um, ability to make counterfeit uh, increases. And that, you'll find, um, is exactly what happens in Thailand. Um, so in Thailand, in three months, basically less than three months, after the setting up of the paper currency department in 1902, they face, the government faces its first forgery crisis. Right? And these are just from an English, the Bangkok Times, um, some articles about a particular uh, case. So in 1903, uh, November 18th, uh, the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank informed uh, the Minister of Finance, a uh, British man named Williamson, that forged government notes had been handed in at the bank. So immediately this guy Williamson, he goes to the <coughs> uh, Eric St. John Lawson, who was the Commissioner of Police for Bangkok at that time and they go to investigate. So after careful inspection, Lawson decides that the note, Captain Lawson, the police officer, that these were indeed fake notes. Uh, in a letter he writes to the Minister of Capital, or the Minister of the, yeah, the Capital at that point, he writes, and quote, on comparing with good notes, we found that certain differences, the most prominent of which were that there was a dot missing under the letters of the of first and the letter of D in limited at the bottom of the note was written as P. So basically this dot was missing, and then here you have to see the, the company that actually prints the note, right? Thomas De La Rue Limited. They had misspelled it. So this was perhaps the most publicized forgery case at the time, uh, owing in part to the international character of the counterfeiters, which included four Japanese men and a uh, member of the royal family, who in a note from Prince Dumrong, well, uh, the press was instructed to keep his name out of the press, actually. So they always referred to him in reports as the Siamese. Um, 
Over the following decade, <coughs> um, this is just one. So a number of other counterfeit paper money uh, cases occur. In 1906, for example, um, there was a case involving a Chinese man um, who is uh, caught for trying to pass a fake note at a gambling house. Um, he had evidently tried to change a 10 baht note by adding a zero to it to make it a 100 baht note in the gambling house. <laughs> Um, another case was another Chinese man. Most of these, the counterfeiters, another interesting kind of thing is that they're primarily Chinese immigrants to this um, The court, so this is another case who was also kind of trying to pass off 10 bot notes to, fake 10 bot notes to the lottery and head tax farmers. Um, he was giving a 10 year sentence. If a quick scan kind of through the vernacular papers as well as the English language papers, turns up more and more and more of these counterfeit cases. Again, this is kind of where I got started on the counterfeit thing because I hadn't been looking. But when you go through the newspapers and the archival documents and you start seeing a bunch of, uh, like every, every few months, every year, then you start seeing kind of counterfeit cases, um, that probably something's going on, right? Um, so there was a number of other cases. Um, another uh, Ch uh, Taozhou Chinese man named Lai had set up a counterfeiting operation in Bangkok, in the southern part of Bangkok. Um, there, the police had found his equipment and about 36 bought in counterfeit notes, also templates and printer's ink. Um, then later in 1913, uh, the police arrested another Chinese man and his wife. Um, they all three were Hainanese Chinese, and they were forging one bot um, counterfeit notes, which is interesting because one bot notes were not really introduced until 1919, so um, they were ahead of their time. <laughs> right? um, in June, okay. So a uh, number of more right, of, of counterfeit cases. There are also cases involving European men at this period, one named Neubronner, who was part of a prominent German family um, located into the Straits. Uh, Neubronner family, I think, was there in Penang for the most part. Um, Neubronner was arrested and then found guilty and sentenced to 15 years in prison. So, with so many of these cases occurring kind of within this short period of time, you know, 10, 15 years, it's no surprise that the same paper that I just showed with those headlines that was reporting all these crimes also ran an op-ed bemoaning the rise of new strange crimes taking place in the city. The article begins by noting, uh, in my translation, one will notice with no insignificant level of excitement the number of strange events in recent days, including banditry, assault, and the number of things that have never taken place before but are happening today. So you get with all these changes in the city, you get a lot of new crimes. And that's what this op-ed is about. It says, these unprecedented events include robbery by automobile, high-level civil servants involved in illegal gambling, the formation of Ang Yi, or Chinese secret societies, and also, of course, the sale of counterfeit banknotes. So there is this new types of crime that were taking place. And these were not isolated incidents, according to the, to the op-ed, right? Because it reminds the reader that as soon as, as it says, as soon as the police had dealt with one new crime, another popped up. So, and it ends kind of on this um, kind of quizzical note. It says, they don't know exactly what the causes of all these new crimes are, these new behaviors, but it says it's clearly linked to the progress of the current error. It's because of the progress of the current error, right? It was important, though, for the, in the editor, of the author of this article, that um, this progress of the current era not become equated with this criminality. All right, they had to protect the modernizations um, that was going on. So, I want to kind of go back just briefly before I end this part of the talk to the fiction, fictional story that I had talked about. This is an illustration from uh, that detective novel that I was just discussing at the very beginning. And I like this kind of uh, as a way to round out this part of the talk because it's a little bit grainy because the copy is hard. <laughs> the conditions are, of, the, of the book are, are quite bad. So this kind of encapsulates what's going on in the city and this kind of anxiety that you start to see <clears throat> Um, related to modernization and the introduction of all these changes. Here you have the villain, right there, covered in black, the black mask, black suit, which is also fits in poison, so if you touch him, you die, right? 
Um, so he's he's um, in a getaway car, running from the police through the Bangkok night across the new railway station. I mean railway tracks onto a new bridge, which is also new, through an electrified night. So basically, you have in this illustration kind of all of the elements that were seen as modern um, in a kind of scene of fleeting criminality. So you have here again basically this idea that with modernization and the adoption or introduction of these new technologies, a sort of kind of anxiety, <laughs> which you start to see bubbling up in a number uh, of places, right? Stop there for a second with the pictures, and then come back to real life again, back from fiction. So, in real life, this fear of technologies or anxiety with technologies is also evident, right? In the counterfeiting cases, let me come back to photography, which I started with as the kind of example. So, in the counterfeiting case that I started out with the 1903 one with the four Japanese men and the royal. During the court case, or that's the trial, the Japanese culprits, one of them, the man named Wada, I, I don't know how to pronounce that, he was actually printing the notes in Kyoto and they were shipped in. He claimed in his deposition that he had made the paper notes himself and that the reproduction was by photography and that he had destroyed the initial plate. In fact, after kind of investigation, it turns out that Wada had made the paper bills in his house and engraved and imprinted them himself by hand. So to confirm this, the police officer, Captain Lawson, requested a report from Mr. McKenzie, an expert in paper and printing at the survey department in Bangkok, who stated indeed that the notes were made by a lithographer's stone and that it is certain that at least two blocks were used since not all the notes were alike. Mackenzie then stated that each stone could produce about 5,000 imprints, a large but comfortingly fixed quantity as opposed to kind of the infinite number that photography could theoretically generate. So the production of counterfeit notes in this case, despite Water's claims, were therefore not with the latest technology of photography, though Water had kind of terrorized the state and police by claiming a superior kind of inexhaustible technology when in fact his counterfeiting powers were a little bit more limited. Oh, sorry. Three years later, there was another counterfeit case. And this time, the new technologies of representation were involved. Um, so for example, in this case, a Chinese man named Yu Bun Teng used photographic equipment to produce 10 baht notes. He was discovered after his daughter-in-law uh, and her, saw her husband photographing banknotes and printing them. She asked him to stop, but he did not, and he did. But she later saw her father-in-law doing the same thing, and she decided to bring one of the fake notes to the police. The police gave her real money for the reward. They then asked her to bring in more, which she dutifully did. Um, so again, the police officers then found there was enough evidence to uh, raid the house where they arrested you, uh, and they found, in, indeed, um, more fake notes and photographic equipment. So again, photography. So counterfeit cases kind of involving or believed to involve photography like these indicate kind of how new technologies of representation were believed to be enabling forgery and illustrate this kind of, again, that anxiety or fear um, that was going on with things like photography and other new technologies. So it's a classic kind of tale, right? A double-edged sword. This is new technologies that enable the state um, to kind of become wealthy and consolidate power, but they are also kind of democratizing, potentially anyway, um, the ability to benefit from this new kind of economy. It also means that in this new economy, different types of people, different groups of people have access to the science, this kind of international science of of leisure or status, you know, these consumer products. And when that happens, um, the trick or the main task of government then becomes protecting kind of borders, right? Whether epistemological borders or social borders. 
So, come back again to the, the case of paper money. At first, in order to defend against counterfeits, they tried a couple of different things, right? One was what we would call a manual safeguard. In other words, requiring signatures um, on banknotes. In Captain Lawson, he writes, in talking about counterfeits, the police officer, if people were to adopt the practice of signing their names on the back of all notes above the value of 20 tickles or baht, it would make it much easier for the police to detect not only cases like this, but also ordinary theft cases. He added that notes should be actually signed by the director of paper currency instead of being stamped, since it would make it much harder for people to forge them. Okay. So this idea of signatures as being kind of the guarantor of, of <coughs> authenticity is tried. But as people in, across the colonies would soon kind of figure out, um, this wasn't going to work. So for example, in um, British India, in the collector of Madras once wrote uh, about signatures. They, the signed papers, may have some temporary effect, but when constantly demanded under the same circumstances, it soon degenerates into mere form and loses all importance that it might adventurously be attached to it. So in other words, when people are required to fill out forms by rote, they no longer serve the purpose because people are just kind of giving, like bureaucracy anywhere in the world now, right? They just give you the piece of paper, doesn't matter what, uh, what it is, as long as it's filled out and formatted properly, everything's fine. Um, so, in other words, um, it was decided that this wasn't going to work. And actually there was a discussion later on that where they decided that the signature could be printed and it wasn't going to be part of what determines uh, the authenticity of a banknote. So, the other kind of thing that they tried was a kind of more technologically based uh, solution, right? Um, and that was to adopt more photography, use photography against photography, basically. And this is actually parallel to what they did in the US in the 1850s and 60s. They had a similar problem with people counterfeiting banknotes, not government notes, but banknotes in the US, and they had adopted more and more technological um, solutions. So just a few quotes, because I'm almost at 40. Um, in 1903, again, that same case, um, the, the head of the, um, the t company that printed the notes, Thomas de la Rue Company, he had written that the photographic art has made great strides and the introduction of isochromatic plates used with suitable colored screens had rendered overprints, which were then protective, inadequate. He went on to state, we have conducted a series of experiments in our photographic studio with the result that we find that to obtain protection against photography, it is now necessary to overprint in a color sufficiently allied to the color of the stamp to prevent the reproduction made by photography. In other words, it's a lot of stuff. That the, the kind of photographic technology that they were using is now out of date. They should adopt even more um, advanced photographic techniques um, based on color. The other thing they wanted to do with photography that photography allowed was standardization. Right. Um, the Minister of Finance noted in 1923 to the, uh, to the king that there were six denominations of bills at that time, 1,000, uh, 100, 20, 10, 5, and 1 baht. And he wrote, the design of these bills has become more complex over time, step by step. And they were no longer consistent, and there were no standardized groupings. It was a good time, therefore, for him to think, or for the government to think about a new regularized design, which they did. The other thing they tried to allow um, with photography was to add photographs. Um, and this was proposed uh, to the king. And the first photograph was actually not a photograph of the king himself, but of La Prakea, um, a temple in, in Bangkok. The other thing that really convinced them or kind of pushed the Siamese government kind of along the technological route was in cases in court, uh, over time, it became clear that having these kind of technological safeguards like photographs, complex um, print, microscopic lettering, could be used in a court case against uh, potential counterfeiters. So 
I'll stop there and then I'll kind of come up with a couple of kind of summary points and then before I conclude. A general pattern, if you look at this, what I've just talked about and you look at what's, what's going on in the archives and the newspapers, a general pattern emerges. As technologies for producing and reproducing representations of the state proliferate, the state makes its representations more elaborate. The adoption of technological safeguards, again like designs, multicolored prints, um, and using photographs over manual safeguards like signatures shows how the Siamese state embraced technologically based solutions, um, again which were actually kind of proposed to them by these international printing and technology companies, um, to solve technologically generated problems. This is kind of a quandary, I guess, of kind of early 20th century, early capitalist societies in the period. So the second kind of summary point might be from this part, so what I've done so far, is that when the functioning of an economy mm -hmm. and a government depend on the authenticity of representations of a state, establishing and maintaining the parameters of that authenticity become the key preoccupation of government. Rules are set, standards are established, and the bureaucracy actually develops to ensure that rules and standards are adhered to. In the process, design, faith in the state and the economy, and economic value are joined in a kind of new money economy. So the ultimate result, maybe to kind of paraphrase Morris and, and Peter Jackson, um, we cited in the very beginning, is a society and a government structured around what people have called an order of appearances in which this Thai state invests or overinvests in policing the way things look the way money looks, the way forms look. So those are kind of the two summary points. And then just in conclusion, cases of counterfeit money are, kind of, are relatively rare today. Um, instead, forgers have kind of turned their attention to luxury goods, um, things like coach bags, elite watches, tourists, for example, including pop stars like Lady Gaga. This is her tweet. Um, and locals both spend their very real money on, on very fake products. Um, in fact, the specialized market for piracy and branded goods, electronic software, etc., has kind of developed. That, and this, this drives tourism, it feeds state agencies, private companies, and the working, and others. There are even kind of grades for copies now, grade A um, versus other lesser copy reductions. It might be said that there's kind of a radical egalitarianism in the economy of forgery albeit one characterized now by kitsch and irony. But this may be kind of perhaps the enduring change or the real revolution that took place in the early 20th century. Now even the working class can and want to afford the fake symbols of international bourgeois society and partake in its economy of science. So that's what I have for today. And if there are questions or comments, I'd be really happy to hear what you have. We have some time for any questions or comments. Sam, so I'll let you uh, field your questions. Sure. Yeah, thanks for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I study global capitalism today, and in the world's top 2,000 corporations, I think the only Thai firms are banks and there's one oil company, PTT. That's their own company. That's one of the agricultural companies? Maybe not in the top 2,000. Maybe a publicly illicit company. Oh. So, were there ever uh, indigenous Thai capitalists, like sort of the period that you're looking at? Like, I'm, I'm surprised that there's already, I mean, they look like Model Ts on the road yeah. in the 1910s. And then you mentioned Asahi and HSBC, and you even mentioned the, the names of the Minister of Finance and the police chief. It sounded Anglo Saxon, so I thought Thailand was never colonized. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it, has, it wasn't technically, right? But the people always use the term like semi colonial or um, things like that. I think, okay, just background, a lot of the advisors in this period were Europeans, advisors to the royal government. So you have people like, the chief of police was British from Guernsey, um, uh, Williamson was British, um, a lot of the provincial policemen were Danish, um, a lot of the legal advisors were maybe uh, Belgian or whatever, right? So. They weren't, again, technically colonized, but then they had, in, the royal government had invited um, foreign advisors in. And a lot of people kind of written about this as kind of crypto-colonialism or whatever, um, or semi-colonialism. 
kind of using or mimicking the techniques of the colonial uh, governments in, in order to consolidate power within Bangkok. But as far as the other questions, a lot, I think, a little bit more, more difficult to, to answer in terms of like kind of the indigenous capitalist. Like, I, from what I, just the literature, the secondary literature, um, there, there is a debate as to kind of who is driving kind of develop, capitalist development, right? There's, um, if you look at this period of time, it's maybe royal government, uh, people from the royal family, um, aristocracy, or Chinese who have been there for a while with links to the elite um, were driving it, but also with a lot of kind of this financial the capitalism is driven by international firms. And if you look at something like the Bangkok Times or something like that, you'll see ads um, for people like Reuters, like people, um, these, these big companies that are still in Brown now, um, saying that they have, you know, if you have a proposition for, for, for something, you know, please contact me at this number. And here, here's the agent for Reuters in Bangkok, and here's his number. Um, and I don't know if you really get um, a broader base development across Thailand until a little bit later, maybe by the 40s. I mean, if there's other people in the room who, who might have different ideas, that might be interesting to talk about too. There are others who have argued that there's this kind of indigenous bourgeoisie that develops in the early 19th century as well. And there, but then, you know, if you read that literature, it's hard to tell whether they're kind of Siamese or Chinese with links to to the world. But it's a problem even now, I think. People talk about who, who's driving development, where the money goes. In the early 1900s, what was the average annual income in Thailand? I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, in the early 19th century, uh, what that would be. I, I don't think, unless somebody else in the room knows, if there's I haven't seen data on average at any of you. In that period of time, it's probably, yeah, I really don't know if they had data. What about early 20th century? Um, I don't know average annual income, but I can tell you, for example, from research that I have done, salaries of, say, police officers uh, per month was something like in the range of 10 to 15 baht. Right? I mean, I don't know, but that doesn't really mean or register, I think this point but it was really quite low um, and you know like the higher ranking civil servants I think were running several times that but the short answer is and I'll just be really frank with you I haven't I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. You know, the reason I say that is if you could perhaps they counterfeit a lot of ten dollar bond notes you could actually become quite wealthy quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean, that's like a month salary then you could basically do it. I mean, that has a has to do with kind of the incentives, right? Like, you could either work a month uh, as a police officer or whatever, and make fifteen baht, twenty baht, or you could you could get your hands on some fake notes and be done with it. And basically, what you could when the newspaper stories were saying was that people would make these things and then they would sell them at a discounted rate. So ten baht could be sold for like five baht. So you could double your money by going to the counterfeiter and buying the money. It was. I think that the incentive was definitely there, in, in a way that say coin. Uh, it wasn't the coin because it, like, it had coin. A question about I. I really liked how you said the government task of protecting social and epistemological borders. I like that term, and I was wondering how. I really, and also towards the end when you talked about Peter Jackson's with, with regime of images, yeah. I think you only touched on that uh, just a little bit. Can you bring that out a little bit more and how that connects with the protecting the epistemological borders? Okay. Yeah, sorry. You shy away from those things so they sound really oh, okay. bombastic. And like, <laughs> no, 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 I like it. Is, but I don't know. I'm just wondering what Peter Jackson, because I don't always agree <laughs> yeah, no, with I, what with Peter Jackson has to say about these things. But I'm just wondering what how, your take on Peter Jackson's yeah, so I think regime of it. If you read that article, he had an article a couple of years ago, and I, I think it's, it's, it's a really interesting article, and, and Morris's stuff as well. He, he kind of, um, I think, if I'm reading it correctly, is talking about how, and I agree with him that the, the Thai government seems really focused. On, on kind of 
making sure that things appear a certain way. Um, I remember when I worked there years ago, I went and delivered, this is a roundabout answer, but it's I delivered my form to the Ministry of Manpower to get my work permit, and I had done everything in, if I can remember, blue ink. And it took me an hour to get to the, to the civil servant with my document. And she was like, what are you doing? This is blue ink. I was like, yeah, I had a blue pen. And she was like, no, this has to be in black ink. I was like, you're kidding me. And she was like, no, but I'll be nice. You know, and then this once, you, you can have black ink, right? I mean, that's just kind of an anecdote. I also was recently at a land office um, with somebody who was buying a condo. And you know, it's similar, like, the stamp on this document is not correct. I mean, there, there's, there's something to be said for, for what I think people like Peter Jackson and Rosalind Morris have noticed, and I, I, I really, I, you could see it. Um, that there is this kind of focus or fixation with the way documents and things look. But I think, so for Jackson, again, if I'm reading it um, correctly, I don't want to misquote anybody, is that he is kind of cites this, in this time period, that the origins of this, in this time period, and it has to do with presenting, Thailand wanting to present itself to the colonial powers as being modern as well. Um, what, I, what I kind of see here if you look at what's driving this, right, it's not necessarily anything specifically Thai, um, but it's part of a larger kind of characteristic of bureaucratic capitalism, right? It, it, it's, if you look again at the United States, they had similar issues. Um, it, it's part of a kind of a more transnational set of rules. And if somebody said to me once who had looked at this paper, um, if you look at Thailand, they were kind of at like the, they were on the feeding end of like these international companies and the international networks, right? Like this company is De La Rue, and then later, um, I can't remember the German company, Get, just, Seki, is Seki? And there's a German company that did the notes a little bit later. These were the people telling them kind of what your bill should look like, what technologies you should adopt. Um, and in that sense, it, what I think I, this research shows is that yes, this this thing, this regime of images is kind of there, but why it's there I think has to do with a complicated network of, of um, these international companies trying to make money on their latest printing ability. So that's kind of where that is. Um, this is kind of a follow-up question to the uh, other earlier question about per capita income. I mean, you made references to the U.S. and, and in passing to India. I'm just curious, you know, to put it kind of in a comparative context, how early or late does Thailand introduce paper currency? Um, I mean, is it, I, I'd be curious if you know anything about the other Southeast Asian countries, then colonies, whether Thailand was a laggard, whether it was relatively early, and whether, you know, the other thing is, I mean, counterfeiting, it strikes me as something that, you know, once paper money comes along, people are going to do. Uh, quite naturally. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to figure out what it is that's perhaps distinctive about Thailand. And you mentioned the the role of maybe ethnic Chinese or the the, the nexus between them and, and state bureaucrats. And and, and, and so to kind of hear a little bit more about what that tells us about the the character of 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 Thai capitalism, but also the relationship to the Thai state. Thank you. Actually, I I okay. So. Again, the easy stuff first is it was introduced, paper currency is introduced in 1902. Um, and I, that is later from what I can tell from other countries just in the region. I don't have the dates for, but I, I'm going to look that up now. <laughs> um, places like Singapore must have had paper currency way before. Um, and in fact, they were using Singapore dollars as one of their base kind of comparison currencies for a while. <laughs> Singapore dollars, Mexican dollars, US dollars, and sterling. Um, so, I, I, my, my understanding or my impression is that Thailand adopted paper currency quite late. Why that is, I don't know. It might have been because they weren't directly colonized, and so there wasn't a colonial government kind of imposing its currency on it. Um, part of why Thailand, if you look again at the, the, what the government officials were talking about when adopting this currency was that this was modern, that paper currency was modern. If you look even early in 1850s and 60s, the decrees from the, the, the king at that time 
the one made famous by Yul Brenner, and K9. Fame, I mean, his decrees were always like, people should stop using coins. Be, uh, no, he should stop using decorating their bodies with coins. We should move to this money economy, etc. And as you move full, uh, kind of into the, the king after him, you start to see again that so we should start adopting paper money. It's modern. And then the foreign advisors also said things like, "Yeah, all the big countries, advanced countries, they use the uh, countries that have made progress, are using paper money, and we don't. We want to appear like that. So I think that had to do with the motivation for." Adopting this again, they there were attempts to do it earlier in the 1880s. Um, there were some complications with Pi script, like the printers couldn't do it. <laughs> um, there was another shipment that that just took a while to get in in the 1880s. Um, and then there were other kind of problems. Locals, again, if you look at it uh, in newspaper accounts, just popular accounts, anecdotally, were kind of suspicious of paper money. Um, and would kind of rely on other things like coin, or go back to coin or whatever. Um, so it, I, I believe it does adopt it late, and it probably maybe because it wasn't directly colonized. What that tells us about the capitalism or development of capitalism, I think, was partly, again, an attempt to appear um, a legitimate as a legitimate kind of sovereign power in the eyes of Britain and France. And that's kind of how it develops, at least what I've seen so far. Okay. But I, I'm, again, I appreciate the question because I think having a kind of a grip on what's happening in, say, in Singapore or parts of uh, in the Straits settlements or anywhere like Vietnam would be really interesting in terms of comparison. Yeah. Other questions? So you come down firmly on the side that the Thais were trying to impress Frank, the French and the British as opposed to trying to convince themselves. No, I think it's kind of a both. It's a mix. You can see it, again, in kind of an ambiguity, I think, when it was anthropological, right? They, in, in the kind of the documents, um, when they're talking to each other, they, they do say, like, you know, this is what they do over there. Even China does this, right? We need to do this. We can't lag behind China. That kind of thing. Um, so in that sense, they do see it. I think they've internalized this this idea that adopting these technologies will make them modern. Um, who their audience is, I think, is both really right. It's it's the British, their advisors, the colonial governments, but and also you can see them. I mean, it's a tool of kind of consolidating authority, right? Um, and that this like this kind of new kind of criminality crops up around you know, things like counterfeit kind of they're policing it, right? It's like now you must do it, you must use our money, you must use this standard money. Stop using your own like your gambling chips or whatever for, for currency. Um, so I think the audiences are kind of both. Okay, so if there's no other questions or comments and we'll end it here. Yeah. Offer a round of applause to Dr. Great, thank you everyone.